Assalamu alaikum. Um, so this video is dedicated to my five top reflections from my Umrah 2020. Alhamdulillah, I've been to Umrah a few times. Um, by the grace of Allah, I've been really, really blessed to be invited back this time. So I want to go through kind of what was different from the previous times, what I've noticed, um, and kind of my top five reflections. Okay, so number one was how I prepared. The previous times I've come, um, I've come with other family members and I've not really done much preparation myself. So it was kind of like going with the crowd. We came with a group and the, you know, kind of the leader will sort things out and I didn't really have to think. And so I kind of got, I don't know, lost with the crowd, if you like. But what was really different this time is I came with my husband and I took a lot of time to prepare. So I looked at the rewards of Umrah. I looked at kind of what I really want to ask Allah for in this you know, journey. Um, I kind of spiritually really prepared and I think that was the big difference. So number one, I would say, if you are preparing for Umrah, it doesn't matter how many times you've come, revisit your intention, revisit kind of the reason you're coming you know really even before you get here start to already be in a state of gratitude that the fact that you're even preparing for it in itself is a huge blessing i was speaking to a sister earlier and um, she had asked her daughter to come she was with her grandchildren mashallah three grandchildren boys very boisterous in the masjid and she said um, i said oh are there you know are there mother you know is their mother here and she said no and she said i asked my daughter to come and she said she wasn't ready and so it was a real moment for me. It doesn't matter, you know, if you've got money or haven't got money, you have to be inclined towards it. You know, Allah has to call you to his place and you have to you're gonna be a guest of Allah and just that alone, your preparation should start way before you get here. So I would say that's number one. So my second one is one that for me has been the biggest is the focus on the rituals. You find that when you're on the mataf, when you're doing your tawafs, people are just rushing around. Some people are following the imam, reading du'as that are just being read out. And I'm not here to talk about thick issues, whether that's allowed or not allowed. But what I found for myself is take that time. Tawaf is uh, it's almost like being in salah, except you're allowed to speak. And Allah allows you to speak. So if you're in salah, what's the thing that we're looking for? Kushu. We're looking for that connection with Allah, we're looking for that concentration, we're looking for that, you know, a sense of like, I'm with Allah and nobody else exists, you know, kind of like in Salah when we say Allah, what Allah is above. And Tawaf for me was kind of, I thought of it that way, and it was so different to the other times where maybe I've just got a dua book out and I've read those duas and not really connected. This time, I kind of went really slow. Um, what you'll find is, especially during Tawaf, is people just trying to rush, trying to get it done. Um, there's this sense of anxiety um, because they want to get to the next place. It's not a race, you know. You don't know if you're ever going to come back. Slow down, you know, be conscious of why you're there. Even if you're just contemplating as you're going around, thinking about, you know, the Kaaba and how it was built and the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was here all those years ago and because of their sacrifice today, we get to be here, millions of other believers around us. You know, why did Allah choose us amongst all those people that weren't here this time? You know, this is our risk. Allah gave us the risk to come here. And it's the same with the Sa'i. You know, as we're doing the, the Sa'i, one of the things that is really good to listen to is before you come try to understand maybe listen to some lectures read some books around what the significance of that particular ritual is you know um, for the Sa'i it's it's Ismail alayhi salam and Hajara and it's about a mother you know for all of us us women out there a mother who you know whose husband left her you know you think about our husbands who go to work every day or some of us end up getting divorced some of us don't have very helpful husbands some of us you know husbands are on the path of Allah and we get despondent you know we think they're not helping us and we we worry how we'll cope and yet there was this woman you know for the end of times for us to reflect on she was left in the desert and she asked Ibrahim is this from Allah and he says yes and he turns away but there's no explanation and she just puts her 
full trust in Allah. And then <coughs> what does she do? She doesn't just sit there and cry. Her babies, you know, if you're here, you see so many children. As soon as the laugh starts, the, all the babies just start wailing. You know, all you can hear is the birds, the fans and the babies, you know, besides the salah going. And you think about a mother who's in the middle of a desert and whose baby is thirsty. And she needs to find water. She needs to find something. And so she goes from this one mountain. She's running. She runs from one side to the other and then back and back. That takes a lot of trust in Allah. But it also shows that she is somebody who doesn't give up. That at that time, what does she expect to really find? Like when you're doing it, really think about how far it is. It's not it's not close. And this you know, this lady, she ran with a baby from this side to that side. And, and now you've got the fans, you've got the clean floor. You know, back then it wasn't like that. This was a desert. You know, and she's desperate and it's sunny, you know, it's hot when you come here try to sit in the sun for a bit and really think how hot it is and think about you know that heat that she must have endured um, and and remind yourself that whatever hardship you're going through as you're doing that walk that if Allah can aid somebody stranded in the desert with a child and for the rest of eternity provide us with the water of Zamzam surely Allah can help you if you put a slight bit of tawakkul in Allah and it's for me I really thought about my children you know, um, I was divorced, um, I was on my own for about 10 years and I was in a very abusive relationship and the amount of times that I thought, oh my gosh, how will I cope with them, how will I provide for them and my girls are a little bit older now, my eldest was quite sick and that ritual really helped me cleanse some of that, you know, really cry out of my system, really think about how much Allah did help and the more you think about Allah's help, the more grateful you become and the more grateful you come, Allah gives you more of that. So that was my second one. <coughs> So taking the time to do rituals is my second one. The third one is shopping versus not shopping. And I'm just going to hit on this. The first few times you come and you think, oh my gosh, I need to take lots of things back. It's very commercialized. Um, and this time I decided not to do that. And it's been really rewarding in the sense that you kind of think, gosh, there are people who come here who save up a lifetime, you know, and they're not as wealthy as some of us in the West. Um, despite how poor we might think we are you know or how much we're struggling i've seen people here whose clothes are torn and you think gosh how did they get here but they're here and so by not adding more to our commercialism it kind of makes you think that subhanallah like it isn't based on our wealth that we're here it's based on allah allowing us to come and i think for me that's one of the things just to be light try to come one time where you know your focus isn't so much on shopping and see how you feel with that inshallah <clears> okay, <throat> hey, number four. I would say number four is, you know, we are here to worship, of course. We're here to make du'a, of course. But Allah tells us, you know, the most beloved to Allah, somebody who's very beloved, like loved, cherished, cared for, is somebody who is beneficial to others. Now, because there's lots of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, the etiquettes are different. However, you know, for me in this video I would like to say work on your own etiquettes and I'll give you little examples if the lift is about to go just hold it for the next person you know there's plenty of spaces to pray make a little bit of room straighten your rows and you know allow somebody who might be rushing who might be late to have a little bit of space if you're going to get water you know if somebody else wants some just move a little bit to the side so that they can get that if you see a mother with a child I mean I was sat next to somebody and this lady had just arrived in Mecca. She's from a third world country. Um, she had a baby with her and she wanted to put her baby next to her. She was at the edge of the carpets. And there was a sister sat in front of me and she was sat on the edge and there was a space next to her inside. And the lady asked the sister, could you just move up so she could put her pram at the side and she could be with her baby. And the sister said, no, she says go to the middle. But the lady couldn't go to the middle or she didn't want to because her baby would be behind her as she sat. And so I was observing this and I, I I felt so sad. You know, I thought, you know, we are here to worship. Of course we are. 
but to help somebody in that slight way she could have just moved over and that's an ex a small example I can give you if you visit the Rauda you know you're there you read your Turaka and you move away and let somebody else have their chance we don't sit there and start wailing and, and taking up that space because just as we want to you know give our salams to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so does the next person you know and ha just having that consideration slowing down even as you're doing tawaf you know there's no need to rush and get in front of people if everybody just walked in a steady pace actually there wouldn't be that chaos i've noticed when people go to see like the um, yemeni corner or the black stone they'll get there you, you you know you can kiss it and then just walk away you, know, you can touch it and just walk away but people want to stay there longer and they they become so emotional about this matter that we end up hurting other people we end up forgetting that it's beloved to Allah to be beneficial to others so when you get here make an intention that during this trip I'm going to be able to do my best to be beneficial to others so Allah SWT will write me amongst the beloved you know amongst his beloved and my last one it's an interesting one. I actually journaled this time, um, which I've never done before. I wasn't sure if I wanted to or not. I didn't know if it was a part of worship or not. Um, but subhanAllah, it's been amazing. So in between my prayers, sometimes, you know, you're reading Quran, you're reading Tasbih, but it can be very easy to get sidetracked and start having conversations with people that are not necessary. Um, although asking somebody where they're from, are they okay, you know, is, is a good thing to do. It is however especially for women I don't know about the men but we can get into these conversations that are not necessary and I found journaling to be an amazing tool um, it's helped me just jot out my thoughts all of the problems that I've had I've kind of done brain dumps I've done um, things that have like interested me I've written out du'as um, I've reworded du'as you know it's been amazing like I could look back at what I'm actually going to do with my journal is not even touch it to be honest, I'm just going to leave it and then inshallah if I come, inshallah when, may Allah call me back, but inshallah when we come back to Umrah again, um, I might pick it up because what it's done is it's, it's made me really focus internally, it's made me think about like my wording of my dua as I'm writing things, I'm thinking okay, I've asked for this but is that really what I want and then I've rewritten it, um, I've written things and also what the journal did for me was a lot, a lot of like friends and family people that ask me for du'as you know instead of just making mindless du'as I was actually writing it out I was actually saying you know I make specific du'a oh Allah you know most kind for this particular person you know for my clients for my family members um, and sometimes when you've done journaling it just kind of gives you this big release like you've been able to dump everything out and you feel so light and then there's more that comes up and you're able to then rewrite that and then put it out again sometimes I've just scribbled and I've been sat there and I've scribbled little words that have just popped up in my mind and, and then those have led me to other contemplations and contemplation is a big part of our theme if you are somebody who journals or even if you don't I think that would be a really beneficial thing to do I think it will help you to sort your thoughts out look at even planning ahead so to end on this video linking to journaling how I ended it was because I've got this journal I've got it, what happened was it came up with themes for my life and I was able to then Look at those themes, the reoccurring things that happened each time I was on my own and I was writing these journals to come up with kind of, ah, okay, these are the things when I go back that I would really like to change. And I was able to come up with three to five different things that I would like to implement when I go back that will have an impact on my life, you know, based on the du'as that I made. Because we made du'a, but we also have to make the effort like Hajara did, you know, we were, she was left, but she ran. You know, she did some work, she made that effort, she didn't become hopeless. And that was another thing, don't become a hopeless, don't think that I've done something a hundred times and it's not working. Do it until you hope in the opening from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are my five things. Um, inshallah Allah calls you to his land and I will see you next time. Assalamu alaikum.